bem-vindos a este terceiro episódio de Portuguese Voices do ano 2021, em que iremos ver, neste episódio, um documentário que realizei há muitos anos atrás chamado Pukiki, The Portuguese Americans of Hawaii, ou os portugueses americanos das ilhas do Hawaii. E a palavra Pukiki, P-U-K-I-K-I, Uh, significa português na linguagem ou na língua havaiana. E então foi por isso mesmo que achei que seria interessante. É um nome que soa a uh, chamar o documentário Pukiki. E, e foi realizado com esta atitude de descobrir o que permanece da cultura portuguesa numa comunidade que chegou às ilhas do Havaí no fim do século XIX, princípios do século XX, e neste curto período de, de espaço de tempo, um, gru, um largo grupo emigrou quer das ilhas do Havaí, das ilhas de, de, dos Açores, quer das ilhas da Madeira. E chegaram às ilhas do Havaí e, de alguma forma, sentiram-se identificados com as semelhanças uh, da, da paisagem, da maneira da, 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 da cultura, da maneira de ser. Uh, e sentiram-se em casa, como alguns deles assim nos dizem neste, neste documentário. E então é isto que iremos ver, o que é que permanece desta cultura que ainda hoje em dia, quando ouvimos uh, na cultura do Havaí alguém a tocar o, o, o ukulele, uh, que no fundo é o instrumento português, a braguinha ou o cavaquinho, uh, ou que diz que estão a comer uh, the Hawaiian sweet bread, Uh, que no fundo é mal assada e tantas outras manifestações de quer, de cultura, quer alimentar e que a comunidade portuguesa poderá não saber neste momento já a língua portuguesa, que eu diria 95 ou mais por cento não fala português, mas sente-se identificado com as culturas, com as raízes, com a maneira de ser e de estar, uh, de ser português. Portanto, hoje sabemos o que é que eles nos têm para dizer. Today, in this uh, third episode of the second season of Portuguese Voices, we are going to see a documentary that I did many years ago about the Portuguese Americans uh, in Hawaii. Uh, and there, basically, I address the main question, what remains of a culture after the immigration stops for more than 100 years? And that's the reality uh, of the Portuguese descendants in the islands uh, of Azores. In this documentary called Pukiki, the Portuguese Amer Americans of Hawaii, and the word Pukiki uh, means Portuguese uh, in the language of Hawaii. Uh, I try to address in that documentary what happens after the immigration stops, which means they arrive there, the Portuguese arrive there in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and by 1910, more or less, the immigration stopped. And, uh, but they remained there, they enjoyed being there, a small number went to California, but the majority remained in Hawaii, and even today, all the descendants uh, are there, and uh, we see the remnants uh, of that through the culture that uh, is predominant, or the general culture in Hawaii. Like when we hear the ukulele, we think that is a Hawaiian instrument, but no, it was brought by the Portuguese uh, when they immigrated to the islands of Hawaii. Uh, and the original name is a braguinha, or cavaquinho in Portuguese, uh, of the same instrument, ukulele. Um, the, the Hawaiian sweet bread, is a Portuguese bread that the, they brought to the island. And all these are manifestations of the general cult culture of Hawaii getting from the, this immigrant culture, the Portuguese, something that is shared with the overall culture and is part of the overall culture. But there are plenty of other elements. There are uh, uh, identification of the Portuguese presence in Hawaii. So let's watch this documentary enjoy it and if you like it click link uh, click like it or follow if you are in facebook or youtube um, and if you like it watch it again they are there for you to to be able to do so so enjoy it and see you next time
In 1876, the Reciprocity Treaty was signed between the Kingdom of Hawaii and the United States of America. This opened a huge market for Hawaii's sugar plantations. Hawaii needed skilled workers fast. Several years earlier, a German botanist had toured the Portuguese islands of Madeira and noted the hardworking people who tilled tropical soil much like Hawaii's. Jacinto Pereira, a dry goods store owner in Honolulu, also suggested that looking to Madeira for labor made sense. His logic was simple. Madeirans were suffering an economic depression brought on by a blight that had destroyed their wine industry. This financial downturn ignited a mass migration of Portuguese labor, and the thousands of Portuguese from the islands of Madeira, Azores, and Cape Verde, who settled in Hawaii between 1878 and 1913, changed the tropical paradise forever. In 1913, uh, the Portuguese stopped immigrating to Hawaii. And from then on, the language was lost, uh, gradually lost. And the only culture that uh, we see today is from word of mouth uh, down through the generations. In 1878 is when the Portuguese first came here to Hawaii to work on the plantations. It was easy for them perhaps to adapt than it might be for uh, Chinese or Japanese. I think the Portuguese had an advantage uh, for the language is somewhat similar to English and the climate and surrounding area was similar to the Azores and Madeira. Always wanted to go to Portugal. Portugal, the continent of Portugal was nice. I enjoyed every minute of it. Then we moved off to San Miguel. We flew over. But as we traveled day to day and went to different places, it reminded me of here at home. Sometime I thought we were going back into the eastern part of Maui, Hana, where there's real vegetation, rainforests, and everything like in Portugal. And uh, that's when I started feeling, you know, I'm home. This is home. Then I, I said to myself, now I can see why the immigrants that came, our grandparents and such, a lot of them stayed and nobody came home back to Portugal because it was similar to, you know, where they came from. So they decided to stay here. And they did exactly what they were doing at home. They raised cattle, they did farming. And then I noticed the, they used a lot of lava rock. Instead, there was maybe no wire fence those days. So they used the lava rock and they made walls, you know, section off the lots and paddies for the cattle and stuff. Grandfather Borges came from the Azores in Rosario, close to Ponta Delgada. He came as a single man. He arrived in 1884 on a vessel that happened to be the fourth ship to arrive with immigrants. They were invited by King Claude Kawa, uh, who knew a botanist, a German botanist. His name was Mr. Hillebrand. And Mr. Hillebrand had been in Madeira, and he saw that the Madeirans were already producing sugar at, uh, and supplying the surrounding countries with sugar. With sugar. So uh, King Klakawa sent him over to recruit people from Madeira. Um, they came on a three-year contract, and their contract included the passage over, which was $75. Um, they, they had a, when they got here, they had a, a little cottage to live in, a little patch of land to uh, garden. 
My grandmother apparently knew him back in the old country because a few weeks after her arrival here, they married. They married at the Cathedral of Our Lady of Peace in downtown Honolulu. My father, his brothers and sisters were all born here. So I am, if you will, the second generation to be born here in Hawaii. The Portuguese was different. They came as the families. So they were really settlers. Although life was hard, if you look at the Portuguese now, they've made something of themselves. They've worked hard and made a place for, for them in the islands. Prior to their coming, there were Japanese and Chinese men working in the plantations. But they only, uh, just the men came. But when the Portuguese came, they brought their whole families with them. Uh, and when they, uh, their contract was over, some elected to go to the, to the mainland, and many of them stayed to become uh, uh, stonemasons. And because on the plantation, they built beautiful walls. And also among the people who first came, there were engineers and other skilled workers. Now the engineers now engineered all the uh, water irrigation systems for uh, many of the plantations here in the islands. They came in, uh, in 1882, on March the 2nd, 1882, and they came on the ship, the Earl Dalhousie. Both sets of my ancestors came the same time, the same ship, so it was easy to find them on the same records. So I was very pleased with that. My grandparents were not part of a group that was assigned to plantation because I say assigned, however, actually in signing up for transportation from Madeira to Hawaii, this was an agreement whereby you signed to come here and uh, go to work for the plantations. My grandparents didn't do that. They didn't sign an agreement. They came on their own, apparently paid for their passage to Hawaii, and in arriving here, had to find other employment, which they did apparently quite readily. A typical day in the plantation would really be very grueling, because first of all, being hot here in Hawaii, you can imagine that they'd start off quite early, waking up a little before 5 to be sure that they're up by 5.30, having had breakfast, and they would have been wakened by a siren that would say, it's the start of a uh, working day. And they'd be off to the uh, fields, working hard, and by around noontime or a little before that, there would be a whistle or a flag, like in the, uh, with the Chinese, there would be a white flag. The plantation workers were brought here uh, because of the demand for labor. Sugar was expanding, and uh, so the, the plantation uh, uh, owners sent recruiters around the world, and they experimented bringing different ethnic groups here. Well, the Portuguese began arriving in 1878, specifically to work on the plantations, up to about 1913. Uh, the Portuguese probably had a better time, let's say, than some of the groups from Asia. Uh, because they were fair-skinned and because of the Portuguese language, they were able to learn English quickly. And as a result, many of the men rose through the ranks and became the Lunas, or the supervisors of the field workers. And the Lunas, uh, although they made money, uh, uh, better wages than the uh, field workers, I think the prestige of being a Luna and the better housing that they received as a result is the prestige that it gave them on the plantation. Uh, in my father's case, he was really, uh, uh, he started off as a flag boy at the age of 10, became a fireman for a locomotive, then became a locomotive engineer. And then, because they did away with the trains, he became a Luna. So it was sort of evolutionary. It wasn't preordained uh, pre that he would become a Luna uh, in later history. But for many in the early years, um, that's what they resulted. They came from all over the globe and found themselves living side by side. Hawaiian, Chinese, Portuguese, Japanese, Puerto Rican, Korean, and Filipinos. 
all living in the same camp. Even though the camp was split into subsections, each race had to coexist. The sugar plantation of Hawaii tested people's ability to accept foreign religion, traditions, food, and language. Surely there were disagreements, prejudices, and even hatred. But the children learned to live together, and the plantations helped give birth to America's most racially integrated state, a state where the majority of the marriages are interracial. Growing up in a plantation camp, first of all, we need to look at the makeup of our camp. There was one section that um, was predominantly Portuguese and next to us was a section for the Puerto Ricans. There was a section um, further up in the camp for Filipinos and another section for Japanese. I don't know that it was so much to isolate people, but because most of them had come from countries where English was not the common language, the plantation camps gave them uh, a place to speak their own language, be understood, to help each other. And at the same time, the, the children went to schools, and the schools were required to teach English only. So the children came to school, they learned to speak English, they went home, and they served as teachers, really, to their parents and they often served as the communicators for the families. By the time I came along, however, everyone spoke English very well. But our camp was still, when I grew up, it was pretty much divided into different ethnic groups. So I was born and grew up in this small little plantation town called Paia. And we lived in camps in that time, and people lived in camps grouped upon either ethnic roots or skills. And in the case of my dad, because he was a skilled employee for the plantation, we lived in a camp called Skill Camp. During my time, we had a Portuguese neighbor, we had a Japanese neighbor, we had a Filipino neighbor. So we all got along together. First of all, the children all went to school together regardless of what camp they came, came from or what section of the camp, they all went to the same school. So in school, you had a mixing of the different ethnic groups. And being children, you were delighted in things of childhood, games, sports, activities, challenges. And the school activities. The school and the school activities. At athletics. So pretty soon you find kids from all the different camps and you find that uh, everybody hurts when they fall down. It yes. didn't matter mm -hmm. what racial group you came from. And there were some good Portuguese basketball players and some lousy ones. Yes. And same thing with the Japanese and the Filipinos and the Hawaiians and on and on and on. Growing up with all the different ethnic group, I'd say is, is great. It's, it's one of the best things that, uh, because at that time, you don't know any. We grew up as a, as a family, like, like one. I would go to my neighbor's house, and they were a Puerto Rican. And so we'd eat their food, and they'd come to my house and have Portuguese food. Then we'd go to another neighbor who was Japanese and eat their food. And this is how we grew up in this multicultural feeling and not having the barriers that we hear about today. My mother would make sweet bread, she would give the Japanese sweet bread. New Year's time, they would give us shushis, they would give us different uh, Japanese cooking. And of course, in later years, uh, you learned how to cook Japanese, you learned how to cook different nationalities. And like how they learned how to make Portuguese soup, they learned how to make, you know, benyadage or different things because of the fact that each of them would share, you know, their knowledge on different cooking, different ways of cooking. I like the way the, how the Portuguese turkeys bring the dish. Yes, the vinho does. Yeah. yeah, I used to love that. It just had the right flavor. I like that better than um, most Japanese food. So I got to appreciate 
other types of food, meaning other ethnic foods, more than I enjoyed, I think, my own uh, ancestral <laughs> type ethnic foods. Um, I mean, I like sushi and all of that, but I, I love the other foods. My favorite food is Oriental, Japanese number one, and that's also a result of my up upbringing. Some of my best friends and neighbors were Japanese, and I love their food very much. I like the flavors, and they're, they're so different and distinct. And we certainly learned and shared a lot of foods. Food seems to be a real common bond. Growing up, as I mentioned, I wasn't aware that I was Portuguese. I became aware, perhaps, of what I didn't know after I was married. I didn't think much about it until my son, my oldest was 11, he's now 44. And when he was 11, he came home from school and he said, Mom, I have to write a paper for my class on what our ethnic group contributed to Hawaii. And I said, oh, he said, we're Portuguese, aren't we? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, what did the Portuguese bring to Hawaii? And I realized that I really didn't know. And I said, well, we bought sweet bread and we brought Portuguese sausage. And he said, didn't we bring anything else, Mom? Portuguese did bring more than food. Like the other immigrants, they held on to what made them unique, and through the plantation camps, their culture spread. Today, the most recognizable Portuguese contributions are the ones that other cultures love the most. Sweetbread, Portuguese sausage, malasadas, and the ukulele. Horsemanship and braiding traditions also made their way into Hawaiian culture. While the British had brought Christianity years earlier, the Portuguese brought Catholic traditions with their devotions, festivities, and processions. Growing up in Hawaii, um, you're not necessarily, especially my age, my age group, um, you're not necessarily raised as Portuguese. You're raised as growing up in Hawaii, America, slash, and you come with a Portuguese family. Um, and sometimes it's not till later that you realize that your family acts this way because <laughs> their families acted this way. And the little things that you do at Christmas time are not necessarily what everyone else does. Uh, you borrow from other families. So being of Portuguese descent in Hawaii is sort of a, a mixed bag. You, you don't really have um, a Portuguese culture. You have a very mixed culture. You have uh, sushi on New Year's, you know, Japanese rice roll. You have um, Portuguese bean soup on Christmas. You know, you have, uh, on Christmas morning, you have the vinidos and, and uh, eggs and sweet bread, you know, it's, it's kind of traditional Portuguese type local breakfast. Um, but it's, it's not like you're, you're raised Portuguese. And, and as you get older, uh, especially with my situation, I, have, I bought a bake shop that was a, uh, a Portuguese bake shop. And sort of as, as a way to add on to that, you wanted to add, I wanted to add more Portuguese products. Well, that means investigating what, the, what that is. And you find out a lot of interesting foods. You find out a lot of interesting customs. 
you start talking to people that are a little bit more connected with a Portuguese culture, and suddenly some lights go on, and you go, oh, <laughs> that's why we do this, or oh, that's why custard is so popular down here. Um, just little things like that. And you, you still remain uh, a, an American slash Portuguese in Hawaii, but you get a little bit more filled out on, on the Portuguese side. You know, you, you, you understand a little bit more where your family was coming from. Some of the um, traditional sausages that we sell would be like the blood sausage or morcella. Uh, this is a very traditional Portuguese sausage. It's made with hog's blood, uh, green onions, different spices. It will have a slightly liver taste to it. Um, not everyone is, is crazy about blood sausage, but we do sell a lot. It's, it's great with eggs and rice, also with other um, type of, as an ingredient in other foods. Uh, we'll sell a lot of the linguiça, which is the traditional Portuguese sausage. Uh, it's usually not this large. <laughs> this is a commercial variety. Uh, you'll find it in links, also in smaller stick forms. Um, one of the breads that have become most popular in Hawaii is Portuguese sweet bread. Uh, it is traditionally a round loaf, but most people in Hawaii will like the square loaf so they can cut it up to make toast or French toast. Not only will we have the Portuguese sweet bread, but you know, we'll do things like mix it with macadamia nuts, and this makes a sort of Hawaiian style type of bread. They were really the bulk of the Catholic Church. There weren't many Catholics here in the early days. The Protestant missionaries came earlier, and many of the people coming here were not uh, Roman Catholic. So the Portuguese were the largest immigrant group that uh, were Roman Catholic. There were some that converted to Protestantism because the sugar planters thought Roman Catholicism was somewhat like Buddhism with a rosary and uh, statues and so on. And they thought that was uh, a disappointment to them. They thought they'd be better off if they were Protestant. We never attended the Holy Ghost Espírito Santo celebrations. My mother was not a Zorian. And so as time went on, we decided we should support both. Anything Portuguese, we should support. So we ourselves joined the uh, Kewalo and the uh, Punchbowl Holy Ghost organizations to perpetuate this little bit of culture that still exists. The Portuguese contribution best known in Hawaii is the ukulele. Though many think the ukulele is a native Hawaiian instrument, the small guitar instrument was brought by the Portuguese immigrants. The Madeiran immigrants played in the 1870s their four-stringed guitar known as a braguinha and as a cavaquinho in the Azores Islands and continental Portugal. King Kalakaua liked its gentle sound and popularized the instrument. Manuel Nunez was the Portuguese that adapted the tuning of the braguinha to the ukulele as we know it today. And so he started, set up his uh, furniture shop on Oahu in Honolulu and uh, at the same time noticed that um, there were shiploads of furniture coming in from Southern California and he had a hard time competing with that. So what he decided to do was to find a need that the Hawaiian people had and that need was musical instruments. They had nobody to make musical instruments for them. Uh, there were no inexpensive instruments, and he knew how to make braguinhas. So what Manuel Nunes did was he studied the Hawaiian mele and the Hawaiian hula, and he changed the braguinha 
to match the Hawaiian mele and the Hawaiian hula. And then uh, started um, uh, playing that instrument, and uh, uh, his, the other Portuguese fellows uh, started playing also, and it became quite popular um, uh, with the local Hawaiian people. Uh, the reason it was popular is because it was very easy to play, uh, it was inexpensive. In those days, uh, 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 a $3 gold piece would buy a braguinha, but in those days, that was like a month's salary for, for some people, so it still was expensive, but nothing like a violin or a guitar. The Portuguese music has a kind of a lilting sound to it, and uh, similarly to the Hawaiian music, it's very soft flowing and uh, very peaceful. Um, I, I do believe there's a, a quite a bit of similarity between the Hawaiian music uh, due to the influence of the Portuguese people when they came. I am going to play for you a song called Olhos Pretos. It's a Portuguese song, and then switch over to a Hawaiian song called O Makalapua. And by listening to the two songs, you will see the similarity between both songs. The rhythms and the melody sounds very similar. Yeah, when he came. Yeah, that's when he came and he started making ukuleles and David King Kalakawa. You know, the Hawaiians, they love music. So they took to it fast, man. And they made the ukuleles famous. Grandpa made them, but they made it famous. <laughs> I don't know what to play. Play anything. Play anything. In the early 1800s, Spanish vaqueros came from California to teach Hawaiians horse and cattle ranching skills. These cowboys became known as pañolos, a name believed to be the Hawaiian adaptation of the word espanol, or Spanish. Through centuries of ranching and farming on the difficult topography of the Azores and Madeira Islands, the Portuguese were well suited to the lifestyle of the Hawaiian pañolo. Its men, like Buddy Nobriga and Henry Silva, carry on the ranching traditions of their Portuguese ancestors.
most of the cattle ranches are Portuguese. Uh, the boy Franco just walked in here. He runs that Calpo Ranch, like I said, with 1,200 uh, mother cows. On a big island, you'll find Freddy Nobrega and, uh, and all those guys, uh, all, all Portuguese boys. Freddy is a, is a big rancher. Alma Cavallo was a rancher at one time. Uh, and they had more cattle than I, th I think they knew how much cattle they had. But, uh, and it was Alma Cavallo, Steven Pereira, Joe Maderis, and, and Johnny Tavares. There was the, the group that got together. They had over 30,000 cows. But they had a lot of, a lot of cattle. I think at that time they were about the biggest ranching operation in the state next to Paca Ranch. They didn't want to be a cowboy. My mom didn't want to be a cowboy, had enough cowboys in the family. So they sent me to trade school to be a carpenter. You grow up working with cattle, milking cows, and you know, raising calves and whatever horses, and it's really hard to get it out of you, out of your blood, you know. So I'm still doing the same thing that I love to do. I do a lot of horseback riding, and I do a lot of horseshoeing in the island. And my majority of my braiding, I braid, I give them away. See, when I went to, I was going to Washington, I didn't want to go. So I, I thought this way. When I learned from my cousins, you don't have to show what you can do, see. And uh, I didn't, didn't say, I didn't have to show nobody. I just do what I like for myself, you know. And people, mostly, a majority of it, I gave it away. And uh, so I said, I wasn't going. Then Lynn Martin, she was the full coordinator for that. Well, Smithsonian and stuff, and she told me, you know, Henry, the first breeders came from Portugal. I did now, and she told me, oh, Henry, I'm not fooling you, I'm telling you. And then as you check back and stuff like that, you know, then you, you know, I kind of read history and all that. The first sailors was from Portugal. The majority of the braiding came from the sailors. Because I got a book about that big, and all oh, the night knots and the braiding they do and that all in the, they got nothing else to do but look ocean, so I guess, they sit down and throw on one rope or stuff, unreal the knots they make in a book. And it's a big book. So it's way before our time, you know what I mean? So then that started getting more into me. And that's how I start, really started pushing this, this braiding and all that. But I braid from young, from t about 12 or 13 years old, I made my first rope. Today, the third and fourth generations of Portuguese Hawaiians question their past. With their language lost and their contributions heavily woven into the multicultural fabric of Hawaiian culture, some find themselves wondering if they are Portuguese, Hawaiian, or American. Many look for answers through genealogy. By tracing their family origins through documents and photographs, they find a link to the past. Others question their ethnic identity altogether. As the product of interracial marriages, being Portuguese is only a part of their ancestry. And I found most of my Hawaiian heritage, but my Portuguese, I'm still searching. And that's why I went to Portugal. And I have found quite a bit now. Bringing the families together with genealogy, learning of their roots. I've had many cases, many occasions where People are sitting right next to each other, or maybe two seats in the back doing workshops. They're related. They're looking for the same line. And you know, they didn't know that they were family. And they get so excited when I start to introduce. I'll say, so-and-so, do you know that, that that gal that's sitting in the back is related to you? And they're so amazed and they're so happy because they start to share. It's a Shrabaha door. And it's Casada Kum, that means he came with a wife, mm -hmm. Adelina Nunes. First of all, when the 
groups arrived here, most of them came because of the opportunity to work on the plantations. Mm -hmm. And when they came, being first comers, they married their own, generally people from their village back home, uh, because they shared a common background. And it was easier, I suppose, to marry somebody who shared your culture, knew your expectations and your values. This was true for, I believe, the Japanese, sure. for the um, Portuguese, and definitely. Then, yeah, you share the same language. Which is very exactly, important. language very, very <laughs> yeah. important. When I married in the late 50s, it was unacceptable still to marry outside of your culture. And when I came home and announced that I had been engaged to a boy of another culture, actually he was Filipino, my parents were very upset. They felt that I should marry either a Portuguese boy or at least someone who they considered white. And of course I paid no attention to them because I had been brought up pretty colorblind living in the plantation. And these were my friends that I grew up with and I didn't have those prejudices and I didn't understand why they did. And of course I just did my own merry little thing and married him anyway. And my mother didn't come to my wedding, but that was okay. She, when she saw her first grandson, fell in love with him and subsequently my husband. So all that is behind us, but it was very intense and very uncomfortable when it happened. Now with my children, who are incidentally, of course, all married, none of them are married to Portuguese spouses. And it didn't, we didn't blink an eyelid when it happened. Those two is another Hawaiian girl that my youngest son married. The mother is half English and half Hawaiian. The, the oldest one, has a lot of uh, Hawaiian in him. Uh, the father actually was married to the, she was a Miss Hawaii when he got involved with her. His half brother and sister is, is a different girl too. She's, uh, she's mostly Japanese with a little Chinese in her. But these two, you can see the pool, uh, the folly is Korean, Japanese, half, half. I got this small one that he lives with me. 90% of the time, so. But, uh, you know, if I'm gonna go kaupo too, he goes, so. Then he's on horseback all day. I don't see a, a, a race of just pure Portuguese down the road. And like if you were to look at other people, you're gonna find that they have uh, a mixture of different races. So how can you extract, how can I extract the Japanese out of my grandson? I cannot do that. And, and, and like I said, I, I look at them, I don't see, I, I don't see Japanese Ryan or Japanese uh, uh, Aaron or Hawaiian Kalani, I see them as my children. And so this is how we live. And this is how I portray how the Portuguese people will be, a mixture of a lot of races, beautiful races. Because you see the pictures, they look beautiful, handsome children. <laughs> In the past, I think the Portuguese stood out more as an ethnic group. And in the plantation history, of course, our role was that of the skilled artisans. And when they brought us over, they brought us over because of our technical knowledge and how we could help the plantations. So we became supervisors and we became mechanics and machinists and locomotive drivers and those kinds of things. Today, the population of the, uh, the, that is identified with the nationality Portuguese is very small. We're a minority, a very small minority, but a very well-recognized minority. It's interesting. We have had some very outstanding Portuguese here in Hawaii, but as an ethnic group, we're very small. And therefore, I think it's very important that we preserve our culture, our identity, 
and that we um, continue to recognize who we are and the contributions we've made to Hawaii. Well, I grew up around the water. My dad you know, showed me how to fish, uh, did a lot of uh, boating, and from there we learned to do uh, skin diving, and from there I just had a passion with the ocean, fascinated with, with uh, you know, the sea, the tide, and, and the, the aquatic life. But surfing is something that's, you know, it's a universal language of anybody who, who is outdoors. And surfing in Hawaii, it is not a sport, it's a way of life, and we have a lot of people who are professional surfers who, in fact, have Portuguese heritage background. In fact, one of the guys that a lot of people know out there today, his name is Johnny Boy Gomes. And, uh, you know, if Gomes is not a Portuguese name, I don't know what is. In future, I think we're going to have to have more technically developed resource centers that will be part museum, part personal history, and serve as bridges between the cultures. I'd also like to think that if you look at it today and 20 years from now, that most of the audience or the the visitors to these centers, or even those who are uh, maintaining the carekeepers of these centers, they're going to look less and less like their ancestors. Exactly. They're look less and less pure, and I, I think you're going to find that the names that are associated with the cultural centers are no longer, if it's a Filipino cultural center, I don't think you'll find predominantly uh, Filipino names. I think, well, it'll still maybe the, the larger group, but I think you'll find the interspersings of all other ethnic type sounding names. I'm 25% Portuguese, 50% uh, Filipino, and I have um, a mixture of uh, French, uh, Scottish, and Irish. I'm Portuguese, Hawaiian, uh, mix Filipino, Chinese, and Spanish. First of all, I'm Portuguese by race, by birth. But because I was born and raised here on the islands, I became, and, and I would identify myself uh, as American Portuguese. In Hawaii, everybody, even though you're not like the Portuguese or something, you're still Portuguese because you know the people, you eat their food, so it's not really as if it's in my blood, but you know it, it's in your mind and your heart. He is a Maui boy, and he's got what it takes. He sees that Maui girl, makes no mistake. It doesn't matter, it's come from behind out. And he's got a real style. And he sees that Maui girl. And what a smile. He's got the best friend to everyone. They ride right well, love that son of a gun. That Maui boy. Come to Valley Isle. That Maui boy. Come to Valley Isle.